Welcome to this video on fMRI pre-statistics. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'll be talking to you about task fMRI and in this video briefly introducing what a task fMRI experiment is like and an overview of the analysis. When we do task fMRI we have a subject that is going into the scanner and they're normally experiencing some form of stimulus. That could be a flashing checkerboard like we have here, or it could be all sorts of different things, either sensory or cognitive or motor. There are all sorts of things that you can do within the scanner. There are some limits. We should avoid having the subject move too much because that can induce head motion, which can create all sorts of problems for our analysis. Particularly talking is something which we would normally try and avoid or sort of motion of the head and jaw. Using a button box or other kind of motor activities are fine, particularly if they can be constrained to the hands and avoid moving the shoulders or other major body parts. So there's a large range of the kind of stimuli that we can have the subject look at or experience when they're in the scanner and perform various different kinds of tasks. But there are some rules associated with what kind of task and what kind of experimental design we can actually have. One of them is that we always need a contrast between at least two different conditions. And that's because MRI is not quantitative. And so the actual value that we get at a particular point in time doesn't have a meaning in and of itself. And for fMRI, what we're really looking at is we're looking at changes in that intensity over time during the periods where different tasks are being performed. You can't just perform one task that is the same throughout the whole experiment. So instead, we alternate between at least two things. One of them is often a baseline condition. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's resting and doing nothing. It can be a complicated baseline where you're actually performing some sort of task, but the other task would be more complicated. And it's the difference between those two tasks which would be interesting in that case. And it can be more than two different conditions. We can have lots of different conditions. But we must have just at least two so that we can compare different things. In addition, we also need to repeat our stimulus over and over again in order to build up sufficient statistical power. And so we would often have something like you can see here in the top right, a boxcar experimental design where we repeat A, B, A, B, A, B. That's only one kind of design. There are lots of other kinds that we can have. But we would normally do something like this. And in fact, this is one of the most statistically powerful designs that we can have if those blocks are somewhere between sort of 10 and 30 seconds long. That gives us a lot of signal to work with. However, it's not always ideal. And quite often we would change that design in order to make it more psychologically interesting or psychologically relevant for the subject. And there is a lot of flexibility in the kinds of designs that we can have still. What we're looking at when we're actually measuring the fMRI signal is actually the change in blood and specifically the blood oxygenation. So what happens when the brain is active is that the capillaries that are carrying the blood are delivering oxygen and glucose to the neurons that are uh, processing it. Ordinarily, there's a certain amount which is being fed along those capillaries and that's what we can see in the basal state here. So at the capillary bed some amount of oxygen is being extracted from the oxygenated hemoglobin turning into the deoxygenated which is the difference between the red and the blue there. The deoxygenated hemoglobin actually has a different magnetic property from the oxygenated one and that magnetic property is such that it starts to change the magnetic field around those cells and actually around that capillary and uh, further out from that capillary. So throughout the capillary bed we have subtle changes in magnetic field which actually disturb the signal. So they tend to reduce the signal that we can actually measure with the MRI. When we go into the activated state, although those neurons require more oxygen and more nutrients, the body actually overcompensates and provides even more blood than is required for that extra, extra oxygen uptake. And so the net result is that actually the amount of deoxygen hemoglobin goes down when we're in the activated state, which you can see on the right hand side. That means that there's less disturbance in the magnetic field and actually a higher MRI signal. So when the neurons become active, the body overcompensates to make sure that those neurons are not starved. It increases the cerebral blood flow, that's CBF, 
and the cerebral blood volume, much more so than the cerebral uh, oxygen extraction goes up. CMRO2 goes up by a lesser extent than the flow and the volume. That means that the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin goes down, the field changes less, and the MRI signal goes up. Overall, the net effect is that when it's active, we see more signal. And we actually make ourselves very sensitive to these small changes in field by actually looking at signals which are T2 star weighted. So you might be familiar with the T1 weighted that we've had for our structural scans. Well, this is T2 star, which is actually the most sensitive that we can be to these kind of fields. It comes with a trade-off later on that we'll see in terms of some of the signal loss that we get from the sinuses. But it is absolutely necessary in order to make us as sensitive as possible to these blood oxygenation changes, which are the fundamental cornerstone of how we're actually measuring our fMRI signal. So it's all based on this, which is also known as the bold signal, which is the blood oxygenation level dependent effect. When we're modeling our signal, we have to take into account the fact that the blood response is not instantaneous. In fact, it's far from it. So we have a hemodynamic response function, or an HRF, which characterizes the signal that we would measure if we had a really short, sharp stimulus. And that is what you see there in, with this red curve here, this HRF. And it's actually quite slow. It takes about six seconds to peak and up to 20 seconds to return back to baseline. And we're going to use that information in conjunction with the timing of the stimulus, which we know because we're actually the ones who've designed the stimulus and we're delivering that to the subject in order to come up with a predicted response. And that's what we're seeing down here. So the black is an expanded version of the stimulus time course that you can see above. And then the red is the predicted response, which takes into account the delay and the dispersion associated with the hemodynamic response function. The process that combines the two is convolution. You don't really need to know the details of how that works. The HRF is something which has already been empirically measured so within FSL, we have a standard HRF available, and that is going to be convolved with the stimulus timing internally within the software. You need to specify to the software what the stimulus timing is so that it knows that because that's something that you've designed and everything else will be taken care of. But it's useful to know that there is this delay between when you actually have the stimulus start and when you're actually going to measure the peak signal. So if we actually acquire a set of images with an fMRI contrast, so bold weighted T2 star set of images, we can look at a particular location. And so here, here we've got one illustrated here. And we can look at the change in intensity at that location over time. And this is our time series, which I'm showing in red here. And that represents our bold signal, what we've measured then we need to make a predicted response, which is what we're expecting the measured signal to look like if actually that brain region was responding to the stimulus. And that takes into account the stimulus timing as well as our HRF. And so that's what we can see in the blue here as our predicted response. Again, that's going to be constructed within the software for you. And what the analysis is going to do is it's going to look for voxels where there is a good match between this predicted response and the measured signal. If we have a good match, then that implies that there is activation related to the stimulus. So the model that we're going to use is the general linear model or GLM. And so a standard GLM analysis for task fMRI looks like this. We are going to correlate the model that is match the predicted response to the data at each voxel separately. So we're going to come up with one predicted response, but we've got different data, different time series at each voxel. And so we're going to do this analysis separately at each voxel. For each voxel, we're going to measure the residual noise, which is the difference between our fitted predicted response and the data that we've got. And then we're going to use that to form a T statistic. To get a bit more of an idea of what I'm talking about, here is what we might see if we uh, load this data up into a viewer. You see on the left hand side, we've got our brain, we've located the cursor at a particular point. And on the right hand side, we've got an illustration of the time series in red. So that's the actual measured data. And then the predicted response. And what the 
the software actually has to do is it has to figure out what is the amplitude which makes a, the best match between the predicted response and the actual data that we've recorded. And so that amplitude is something which is going to be fit by the GLM and that is one of the unknowns which it actually determines. And so the magnitude of that fitted response, that amplitude is very important because we're going to compare it to the amplitude of this, the residual noise, the difference between the data points and the actual fitted model that we have, our predicted response. And that's what I'm talking about here when we have the t-statistics. It's basically the ratio of the amplitude of that model fit to the average amplitude of the residual noise. Once we have our t-statistic, then we're actually needing to threshold that in order to come up with statistically significant values. And then we're going to display all the ones which are above that threshold and hence are statistically significant as a map. And so we would see something conventionally like you see on the right hand side there, or the grayscale is just the brain. The colored voxels are the ones which have survived that thresholding step. And they are the ones which are statistically significant. Now, signals of no interest or artifacts can actually affect both the activation strength and the residual noise, depending on the timing and what they look like. And so they cause us some problems in this standard GLM analysis, because they're something that we don't want, but they're always present in the data. We're always going to have some level of noise, some level of artifacts in the data that we acquire. And so we actually go through a whole bunch of pre-processing steps in order to reduce or eliminate as many of these effects as we can to start with. And so that's what we're going to talk about in one of the next videos on pre-processing for task fMRI. And we're doing it so that we can eliminate all of the other signals of interest which are different from the signal that we care about, the one created by the neuronal activation, the bold effect, that predictor response, and just standard white noise that is always going to be present. So in summary, our task fMRI experiment involves stimuli that need to be repeated many times in order to build up statistical power and include at least two conditions, but they can have many more different conditions. We have to have at least two in order to see changes, which is the only thing that we can actually detect. fMRI is based on the bold effect, which is about the blood flow, and we have an HRF, a hemodynamic response function, which models the delay in the spread of that blood response. We're going to use that in order to get a predicted response, which we're going to use in our general linear model in order to match that with the data, fit a, an, an amplitude for that, which is going to then give us a statistic value when we take the ratio of that with the residual noise. We're then going to threshold those values to create a map of voxels which are statistically significant. And that's the overview of how our analysis is going to work. But as I said, the next thing that we really need to look at is how we actually do the pre-processing to get rid of as many of the signals which are structured but not related to the neuronal activation or just straightforward white noise.